Thanks for joining us. It's a Father's Day weekend, but it is also a counterculture weekend. It is the third week of our series that we've been involved in. And so if you've missed any of the previous weeks, we've been really talking about how to live different than maybe the way the world is living, how we can stand out as believers during a time where the rest of the world is going one way, we can go a different way. And I want to share with you this morning really how dads can apply some important things in their life and live very counter culture to the way maybe the rest of the dads and men are operating in our world today. And so as I share this uh, time with you, I want to kick it off by having a little uh, scripture here from Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 22. Let me read it to you. It says this, so I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for it is his lot. Now I got to tell you, this is from Solomon, wisest man ever lived, and he says that, you know, we, we ought to rejoice in all the work that we do, because as men, that's just what we do. We, 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 we get our work done. And I have to say, I, for me, in my life, I, prior to ministry, I have many different secular jobs in my life, and, and I got to say, I didn't always rejoice in them. You know, some of them weren't as good as, as others, and I did a lot of different tasks. My father, by the way, uh, did teach me uh, work ethic. My father taught me the discipline of, of working and working well, that when you get a job, you know, you show up on time, you get your work done, you honor your employer. My father taught me those things. And so I certainly learned the disciplines of being a good employee for an organization. Uh, but along the way, in all the different jobs that I had, uh, one thing that I can say has been the greatest job I've ever had in life is the job of being a father. It has been by far the greatest work that I've been involved in in, 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 in doing and accomplishing the things that God has called me to do as a man, to be, to be the father that I need to be. I have to say something I've learned about the job of being a father, and perhaps some of you have learned this as well. I know there's some women that have learned some things uh, that are similar to this in being, being a mother, but I learned this about being a father. It turns out the job does not pay well. Uh, in fact, it's a money loser. Let's just be honest about it. Uh, the hours uh, should uh, be considered illegal at times. Uh, there should be maybe a lawsuit involved, but there's not. Uh, you are on call 247, as it turns out, if you're really doing the job uh, of being a good father. It could cause your hair to turn gray uh, quicker than maybe you ever imagined. Uh, for some of you, you learned that you know, being a father could cause you to lose your hair quicker than you ever imagined. I see that's the case as I look out in the audience right now with some people. Uh, fathering you know, is a price to being a father. It's not easy to be a father. I learned in, in the early years when, when it seemed like it, the time was coming and it was going to be a father. I remember thinking, okay, God, I'm going to need your help. I don't fully understand all the things about fathering, but I knew this, that my heavenly father offered me the ability to really uh, get involved in, in my life and help me, whether it was fathering, being a husband, whatever it was, God could offer me the help that I needed to win. God wants to see you win the race as a man that he's given you in life, but he wants to come alongside and help you accomplish the victories in those areas of life that he's given you to run the race that he's given you to run. Let me give you a great scripture, a, a uh, let's just say like a, a stirring of a man's soul kind of scripture. Joel chapter 3 and verse 9, here's what it says. It says, say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war, call out your best warriors, let all your fighting men advance for the attack. I hear that and I say, yeah, okay, give me some of that. Well, that scripture is about going with God, winning a battle with God in your life and God by your side. And that's the reminder, if you want to be the father that you need to be, you come to a place where you say, God, I need your help in this. I'm talking about a faith step. A faith step where a man goes, a woman in her life as well, but a man goes, hey, God, I believe by faith that you being involved in my life will produce better results in areas of my life than if I did them on my own. That starts with a faith step. God, I, I believe that if, if your ways are better than my ways and your thoughts are better than my thoughts, 
that it would be right for me to invite you in to various areas of my life and to say, okay, I believe there will be better results. That, that is a faith step. Now, once you do it and God shows up and you see that he will deliver on your behalf to win in life, you get the confidence to do it more and more. But it starts with this very trusting step that says, you know what, in my marriage, I believe I could do it my way, but if I do it God's way, it will be better. That I believe that anything in my life, right, if I'm going to be a father, that I could do it my way, or I could say, you know what, God's way is so much better. With my finances, I could do it my way, or I could do it God's way, and it would be so much better. With my business, with my career, whatever it is, my faith, I say, okay, okay God, I'm inviting you in, and now I can grow into what it is that you've called me to. I can advance on. I can win. I'm reminded of Moses' journey as a little baby and then growing up as a boy and into being a man and how he had to come to the understanding that he was going to identify with who he really was and who God made him to be. He was going to have to uh, deal with Pharaoh. He was going to have to uh, lead the Israelites out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea and towards the promised land. And, and so in that leadership, right, if that was going to happen, what a big job, right? He was going to have to, by faith, trust that God could deliver on his behalf. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. It says, by faith, when Moses had grown up, and I'm just going to stop right there. By faith, Okay, by faith, Moses is going to win these battles for his life. By faith, he's going to win, and he's going to win as he's growing and growing and growing on his journey in, in life. And, and I talked a few weeks ago about growing up, and I said, you know, a few weeks ago I was sharing about how important it was to, as believers, if we're going to be different in the way that we operate, that people see us and watch us, that it was going to require the believer to grow up grow up in their spirituality, right? You can't stay stagnant, can't stay where you've been. You've got to decide that you want to grow. And I, and I was sharing several weeks ago, I shared like, okay, when do you actually grow up? And, and how people try to apply different times and when we're actually grown up, right? Some people will say you're grown up at age 16, or some people will say uh, because of various things, it's 18 or it's 21, or you know what? You're, you're all grown up when you're 20 because that's when you can finally rent a car legally, you know? And so there's all these different ways. But then I, I came back and I said, oh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you know it, but science has told us that, you know, women's minds, women's brains, like they're not fully developed until their mid-20s. And men take a little bit longer, right? Men go like like mid-20s or upper 20s before their brains are fully maturing. And so when you look at what science says, science says, hey, there's really a full-on maturation process that could go on into the 20s. And so I shared that with the church, and then I came home, and my daughter was home, and, and she had been out that weekend that I shared that with the church. And so I was just sharing with her about Hey, hey, Brooke, when do you think, you know, you, you grow up? And I was sharing with her all these different markers, 16, 18, 21. And then I shared with her that science says, you know, but women, their mental age doesn't necessarily mature until maybe their mid-20s or so. And then I said to her, and boys and men, how long, baby, how long do you think it takes a man to mature in his brain? And she said, hmm, how old are you, Dad? <laughs> she really said that. So I thought, well, I apparently got a little work to do. <laughs> but look, the only hope that you and I have as man, woman, whatever it is, to reach our God-given potential is inviting God in, all right, inviting God in and saying, God, I want you to develop me. I want to grow with you. I want to be on this lifetime self-discipline commitment to advance on in my life. God, I, I'm, I'm relying on you for my marriage and my family and everything in my life. And hear me, there is one immutable catalyst that absolutely is at the centerpiece of any man, any woman as well, but any man who is growing and experiencing success in his life. This immutable catalyst uh, for anybody that's moving forward, not backwards, uh, a man who's advancing from better, going to better to better, not into worse, a man who's moving from richer to richer, not poorer to poorer, this one immutable catalyst of to grow stronger, not weaker, to grow up and not grow down, it is called men self-discipline. It is the discipline that you apply in life, the discipline of self-discipline 
to keep on growing, to keep on advancing. I wrote this in your notes. Men who are living counterculture today, here's the reality. They're understanding and they're embracing the self-discipline that it takes to continue to grow. By faith, I'm growing. I'm inviting you, God, in. By faith, you're advancing me on, and I'm not going to stop. I'm going to stay focused on that development. It is a common denominator, folks, of men who are growing in their life. You embrace this understanding that in order to be disciplined, there are short-term pain. There absolutely is. If you're going to be disciplined and you're going to apply disciplines in your life so that you can advance and grow and be better, there sometimes are short-term pains, but what do we know? There's a long-term gain. Sadly, you know what I deal with with a lot of men who are older as a pastor, what I deal with? I deal with a lot of men who got older in life and got to the end of their life, and they weren't willing to live a short-term pain of discipline in various decades of their life, and now they've come to the later stages of their life, and now they have a long-term regret. And they talk to me about decades of their life that they missed because they're out doing this or that, and they weren't living with the self-disciplines that it takes to advance on. When he grew up, when Moses was growing up, by faith, he was infusing the things that he needed to infuse in his life so that he could win great challenges in his life. Hey, Amen. Let me ask you a question. What's an area of your life that you need to grow up in a bit? I said this uh, a month or two ago. If a man ever is in denial about whether there's an area of his life that he needs to grow up in, all he needs to do if he wants to figure out wh what needs to happen, just ask his wife. She'll tell you a couple, probably, areas that you might could grow up in, in your life, to, to apply some discipline so that you can, so that you can ad advance on. Uh, some of you may remember this study, that, or heard of this study. It was kind of a famous study that was conducted in the early 60s, and they, they, what they did is they put them, some four-year-olds in this room with a bowl of mush, uh, marsh marshmallows, put a bowl of marshmallows there, and, and, they, and they looked really good, and they looked really, really yummy, and they put the four-year-olds there, and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to see which kids over a 15 to 20-minute period can wait for maybe like a greater reward, or which ones will self-indulge with instant gratification. They don't have the ability for delayed gratification. Instant gratification, and they will start eating some of the marshmallows before it's to, before they, uh, the time of this experiment ended. The way the experiment was working is that they put them in the room and about 15 or 20 minutes later, the person conducting the experiment, he'd leave and then he would come back in with the thought that maybe there was something better awaiting them if they would just be patient for 15 or 20 minutes. Well, what did they find in the study? They found that some of the four-year-olds couldn't wait and they just went after it right away, instant gratification. They also found that some of the other four-year-olds would sit there and be very patient and wait for the time to be up for the person doing the study to come back into the room. Now, they did that study and they found some interesting characteristics about the self-discipline that some four-year-olds seem to already have versus others. What they actually did, I don't know if you know this, but 14 years later, they took many of those kids when they were graduating high school and they started talking to them. And you know what they found? They found that the same kids who believed in self-discipline at such a young age had been living this out for many, many years of their life. And as they were graduating high school, the ones who had self-discipline were already on a healthier trajectory in life. They had better relationships through school. They had better dreams and visions for what their life would be. They understood things about money and, and how to handle their resources better than some of the ones who were not interested in delayed gratification, right? What they discovered is intrinsically some of these kids had figured out the importance of what we're talking about here today, self-discipline. I don't know if you know this, but about 40 years later, they did the study again in around the year 2011, uh, a, a scientist uh, out of uh, Cornell uh, Medical did a, an additional study. Uh, the, the, uh, the doctor's name was B.J. Casey. And what they found, 40 years later, they went back to the original study group. They found 59 of those kids who were once four years old. And they went and said, okay, all these years later, how are they doing in their life now? And you know what they found? <laughs> they found that still the same things were true. 
Uh, those who were self-disciplined had better outcomes in their education, had better outcomes in their income, had better outcomes in their marriages, had better outcomes in their family, all born out of something like a self-discipline, a self-control. God gives, he offers freely the spirit of self-control. What do you know about somebody who's not operating healthy in the spirit of God? They lack self-discipline. They lack self-control. God says, I want to come along in the life of every man, every woman, every child, and help them discover the power of self-discipline. Teddy Roosevelt said this, with self-discipline, anything is possible. The only quality that God is utilizing in humanity to separate oftentimes people who are experiencing success and people who are not experiencing success. It's not formal education. It's not how intellectually bright you are. It is self-discipline. I, I was watching this week, you know, uh, Tom Brady was uh, inducted into the New England Patriots Hall of Fame. And I don't even, I mean, what is, what is a Patriot? I don't even know what that is. It's some other team. I, like, I didn't even know Tom Brady played for another team. I thought he's been with the Bucks the whole time. Turns out there was a whole other team involved uh, years ago. I guess maybe, maybe he played there a year or two or something. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, they did a uh, ring of honor or like a Patriots Hall of Fame thing, and they did a speech for him, and he came out, he did the speech, and there's something he said in the speech that caught my attention based on what we're talking about here today. Just a little 30-second clip of Tom Brady just, just this week. Here's what he said. Listen to this. To be successful at anything... The truth is, you don't have to be special. You just have to be what most people aren't. Consistent, determined, and willing to work for it. No shortcuts. If you look at all my teammates here tonight, it would be impossible to find better examples of men who embody that work ethic, integrity, purpose, determination, and discipline that it takes to be a champion in life. Well, there you go. And really, he's talking about football. Well, then he's moving it on into life a little bit. I'm talking to you about what God has already known for humanity, that if you'll show up, if you'll get the job done, if you'll apply the self-disciplines, if you'll be present and accounted for, you can be a part of something special. God gets involved in your life as a man, and you can advance on as you grow in the disciplines that God is giving you for your life. But I put this in, in your notes. It, it's not just this discipline, uh, uh, this uh, sort of 30,000 foot view of discipline. Uh, there's a self-discipline a man must apply in his, and I put this in your notes, in clarifying and deepening the values and priorities that are important to him for his life, for his family, for his marriage. A man has to embrace a level of discipline that causes them to consistently pare down, filter out things that they have been doing in their life that are no longer useful or helpful for the success of a marriage or the success of being a father. All right, so you grow up in your teens, you get into your early 20s, and there were things that you used to do when you were younger, and, but you now, though, okay, those were activities, and they were so fun, and you did a lot of those things, all right, but now maybe they're not so helpful for this new marriage or for being the father that you need to be. And I had to consistently, and still do to this day in my life, filter out some of the things that are unhelpful to me in my life that keep me from advancing on and apply and dig into the things that actually do help me, that actually cause me to advance and grow in my relationships and in my, in my family. When you get married, for example, men, women, a, a best way to describe a, a healthy marriage is this. It's two funerals and one resurrection. What am I talking about? You, you're putting to death some of the old way of living. Because some of the old way of living ain't going to be helpful for this new thing. But when God gets involved and you say, okay, we're putting an end to some of the old way of living. And now we're going to grow and journey together this portrait of resurrection advancement on into something better. I like that, right? And God says, I want that for your marriage. But you have to be willing to maybe kind of deal with some of the old things so that you can now advance on into, into new things. Paring down those priorities is critical at marriage. It's critical when you have your children. There are just some things, men, that you used to do in your teen years 
or your early 20s, but they're not helpful for you now to have success. You, you, you know, I had to uh, model values and priorities that mattered most in my life, but I had to do that ultimately to set an example for my children because my children are watching, right? They're picking up on things that I do. One of the cool things of having children is, is watching them when they're younger start to pick up on some of your mannerisms. So some of them are cool, some of them maybe not, but you start to see that they're watching you and they have some facial mannerisms or things that they do that kind of you do and, and they pick up on those things and it's kind of maybe it's kind of cute, right? But they're not just picking up on those things. They're actually watching us in everything that, they, that we're doing. And they see your priorities. They see your values. They watch and say, what really does seem to matter most to dad? And then they grow up and they oftentimes do some of those same priority livings that they watched in their household. And some of those could be very good and some of them could be very unhelpful. I had to model for my girls that, hey, here, here's, here's what we're paring down to as a family. God, marriage, raising my children, and then the calling that God has given me to, to, to lead and teach in the church. And, and these were going to be kind of the, the flow, the journey uh, that we had to be on together as a family. I, I modeled that church matters. Church is a big deal. We don't come to church. There, all my family's here this weekend. We don't come to church because of obligation or because we have to. We come to church because this is where the believers gather together, shoulder to shoulder, for inspiration, for encouragement. The message of God is going forth. We're serving one another, caring for our community. Like they understand the values of these things, and we taught it. And we lived it day in and day out. I mentioned uh, a few uh, weeks ago on Mother's Day, how my mama was so good at reminding me that my friends matter. And I got to make sure I have the right friends in my life because unhealthy friends could lead me to the wrong direction in my life. I learned that too from my father. He also taught me these things. And, and I had to model then for my own kids. Hey, 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 there are right friendships and there are unhealthy friendships. And I had to live that out in my life so that they could see kind of, hey, these people are healthier for dad than others. And I need to have that for my own life as well. You have a responsibility as a man to be disciplined, to install a discipline that causes you to be laser focused on the priorities and values that will influence your children in the long term. Deal with the ones that are unhelpful to the relationships and embrace and dig into the ones that are helpful. Hebrews 12, 11 says this, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful actually to be, I mean, again, it's a sh there's a bit of short term pain in deciding to be disciplined. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who've been trained by it. First of all, this is talking about things of the kingdom of God, but at the end of the day, anybody in this room who's been disciplined for a period of time at something and saw the fruits of being disciplined knows that this text is right and true. And God's reminding us here in this text that the things of the kingdom certainly with discipline uh, become more uh, become stronger and stronger. But I love what it says at the end. It says, says they've grown stronger, having a harvest of righteousness at the end. It says it's available to those who've been trained by it. In self-discipline, I got into training about values and priorities. And now my girls have been under that umbrella when they were living in my home and they also were raised up in that, trained in that, so that they could advance forward and do their own harvest of righteousness. I, I put in your notes that countercultural men, they're expanding the bandwidth. He's expanding the bandwidth of his interests and serving capacity. A man who's growing, uh, who's applying disciplines in their life, uh, advancing for the goodness of, of, of the things that God has given him in his life, he, he's growing in his, in his interests. Philippians 2, 4, let each of you look not only at his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Left to myself, not understanding this in my life, left to myself, I could have easily gone into my marriage and, and into my uh, raising my children only being worried about my own interests. Let me tell you what good fathers learn. They learn to be interested in the things that their kids are interested in. 
And sometimes the things your kids are interested in aren't the things that you were interested in growing up. And so in order to get kind of in the mud, to play with them, to, to get on the floor of their bedroom floor, or, or to go out and do the things that they want to do, as a man, a good father expands the interests of his life. And this was hard for me because I grew up in a boy, boy, boy home. And it was all football and baseball and basketball, and we went outside all the time. I know that's Weird for some younger people. Like, we went outside. I know. It's really weird. Anyways, and it was in Florida, and we did. We went, and we was playing cops and robbers and good guys and bad guys, and, and we would make guns out of sticks and whatever. And then when we got older, we went out and bought real guns. Like, this is just what we boys were doing, you know, in the South growing up. And we played and played and played. And then I got older, and then I had married, and then I had girls. <laughs> and they weren't interested in any of that. We're young, they're young, growing up and a few years old. And now, all of a sudden, I'm in a car and we're on our way to a dance recital <laughs> in tutu. <laughs> Dresses with hair done, sparkles. I did not grow up in this. But here's what I learned. I watched as their eyes sparkled with excitement about where we were going that night. And I learned that what we were about to do was what they loved to do. And I had to get into it. I had to learn it. I had to get excited. I had to get invested in so that I could be a part of their life and, and they could see that dad was enjoying the things that they were enjoying. They got a little older and they got into cheerleading. And they both did, did cheering for their high school. I did not go to high school or games, at the football game, worried about the cheers that were happening on the sideline. That was not a part of anything in my life. Now, all of a sudden, I got girls that are cheering. They come home. They want me to help them stunt. Like, can I get on your shoulders and stuff? And will you throw me around? And dad, help me do backflips and things like that. And now, all of a sudden, right, if I'm going to kind of get involved in their life, I got to learn things about cheerleading. This stuff is, is important. So many times you see dads vacating, abdicating their role of just being somebody who plays with their children because their children are starting to be interested in things that dad was not interested in. And he does it, it's foreign to him. And instead of taking that step to develop the interest in their interest, he, with, he withdraws and says, you go do that, that's your thing. No, what we got to do is we, we get involved. And it's not just expanding our interests. We, we are serving our household as men. We don't serve our kids like they're on some sort of pedestal in the home. Not like that. But as a man, you know, if you're going to lead and you're going to lead first and lead by example, you want to be the leader of the home, all right, that means that, you know, when it's time and there's things that are needed for your kids, things that need to get done, you don't abdicate the role and say, you know, honey, you, you do all that, like you take the lead role, all right? So I changed diapers and I cleaned up some poop, man. And, and, and I had to learn to serve when the first one came and then the next one came and, and sometimes there was vomit, you know, and I cleaned up the... Cleaned up the vomit. When the vomit happened, you know, then we, we some of you may not know this, but at, uh, uh, at, at about the time my second one was born, we took in a Down syndrome girl. And she lived in our home for 11 years before she passed away. We actually took her in. She's 48. And uh, she passed away at age 59 in our house uh, there. And, and so we, I had to serve there for her as well to help in the household, I had to go first and be the person who was expanding my bandwidth of what it meant to serve as we had one child, two, and really a third entering the home. I put in, in your notes. Countercultural men, here's what they'll do. Uh, put three things that, that have to be front and center in a healthy, growing home. These disciplines. Number, number one, he has to be a servant. I kind of touched on that. But I'm talking about being a helper. 1 Corinthians 4.1. Let a man so consider us, okay, examine us as believers, as let us be considered as what? What does it say? As servants. Are you a helper in your family? Not the second, but the, the first helper. He goes on, it says that we would be considered uh, servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God, the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. All right, so the, by the way, this is talking about 
the mysteries of God. And so I want to be clear, it's talking about in, in, in this text, we're servants for the kingdom of God, stewards for the mysteries of God. So this is talking about things of the kingdom realm. But then also at other times in the scriptures, we see it being applied to just our day-to-day -day disciplines in life. And so I went there in your notes, I put, not only you would be a servant, you'd be a steward, a manager. God is calling on men who want to live different than the way the world is living to manage the things that they already have. Not sit in a place and crave all the things that they do not yet have or go into 20% interest debt for thousands of dollars to get things that they were not meant to have yet, but to manage the things that they have right now and to manage them well. And the man who's being managed, managing the things that he has well is then able to be blessed with more. Here's what it goes on to say. I put in your notes, he, a man would be, be not just a steward manager of what he has, but he would be a sower. He's an advancer. Because every man in this room who's living well wants to advance. We want to move forward. And through taking care of that which we already have now and managing what we have now and managing it well, we can then dig in deeper for things of the future. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, Now may he who supplies the seed to the sower, God supplies the seed, he supplies more to who, the, the who, the what, what does it say? The, the sower, not to the rich, not to the poor, not to people who are socially cool, to the person who's willing to dig in with what they have now and dig in because they want something better in the future. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food and supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. A portrait of somebody who's doing the best with what they have and digging in for what may be more in the future. I put in this last section in your notes, a man who's living counterculture is deepening his relationship with God. I, I got to tell you, when, when it, this was the season of my life where I dug into my faith, when, uh, when it became apparent, I had a child on the way. And uh, I remember the moment that I got the message that I was going to have a it was confirmed that my wife was pregnant. You know, we did the home pregnancy thing, but then you go into the doctor. She went into the doctor to get it confirmed. And on that particular day, she had a doctor's appointment, and I had this huge sales appointment. It was one of my biggest I had ever had. And so I was in kind of that appointment, kind of waiting for everything to begin. And I get a message from her. She's at the doctor, and the doctor has confirmed that, you know, we're going to have a baby. And, and I get the message. It's just a couple of words you know, just said, I'm pregnant because it came in on, on one of these beepers, <laughs> all right, where they finally figured out how to send a, a text message on the pager. I know I'm talking about something that some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, beepers and pagers, and that's okay. That's okay. Just think text messaging in its infancy. And so I got this message and it said, hey, I'm pregnant. And I can remember, I did not hear anything else going on in that meeting hardly because I'm like, okay, it's official. You know what? But here's what's official is I feel like I don't know what I'm doing to be a dad. And over the next many, many months, I started to dig in. Okay, what does this look like? And then, and then the day of the arrival of the baby came. And, you know, I'm standing there right in the birth canal lane. You know what I mean? Like, I'm right there and I see it. In fact, I took a video that day and put it up on the screen. I want you to see it here. No, you don't want, you don't want to see that. My wife would kill me anyways. <laughs> but here's the thing. You're in that moment like, all right, it's real. And are you, hey, buddy, what are you going to do now? And I can remember just entering this phase of my life where, God, I need your help to be the dad that I need to be. I entered a time in my life of deep and fervent prayer for my children. And I can't tell you, they're in their 20s now and I hadn't stopped praying for them. I prayed for them in those early years to develop wisdom. I prayed over their fears that they struggled with. I prayed at times where I needed help to help them. I prayed over them for their choices. I prayed when they got their licenses. I prayed for financial provision for them in the future of their life. I prayed for their future husbands that weren't even, they weren't even dating, and I was praying for their future husbands. 
and now uh, one is married and, and, and doesn't live in the home in the other, my home. The other one's got one foot out the door. She goes off to college and comes home. She's home right now, which I've enjoyed seeing her. But, but at the end of the day, I'm not done praying for them. I'm going to tell you something. Having children ought to drive you to your knees, man. Praying, God, I need your help. But God, I'm praying for these babies that you have given me in my life. And so that deepening relationship was, with God was so valuable. Can I tell you what a deepening relationship with God did for me, though, to help me in my marriage and help me in raising children? See, I, I made mistakes. I didn't get it right every time. And, and to this day, I still don't always get it right. But when you're on a deepening relationship with God, God does something in a man's life that's, that, that's counterculture. Uh, God softens his heart, he humbles himself, Pride begins to subside, and he begins to learn two of the most valuable words that will impact a marriage and family that maybe he's never spoken much ever in his life. And I'm going to share these with the men in the room, and maybe it'll help some men here today. For some of you, this will be new, but let me just share it with you. It's, I'm sorry. I, 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 I did it. I messed up. I made the mistake. I said some words to you that were hurtful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being an idiot when you needed me to step up. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? These valuable words for my relationships inside, inside my home that came, uh, that softening came out of a deepening relationship with God. You know, every year I take a group of men, we go on a trip, it's called Wilder Heart, and I take about 40 guys every year and, and I invest in them. And what are we doing? We're recalibrating so that we can know what disciplines in our life will help us as men become the men that God wants us to be in our own individual race that God has given us. And so I take those men this year, uh, I, I heard that coming into the weekend, we had 30 of the 40 spots filled for the trip. So we just had 10 more to fill. It's kind of interesting, like the women's trip, right? They'll have a sign up at the beginning of next year. It fills up in 24 hours with a waiting list. The men take, we're at 240 days and we still ain't filled. But anyhow, we will fill up this weekend. I can guarantee you that. I've already heard we've had some signups. But here's what I, I want you to know as a man. If you're here today, you thought, oh, I want to go on that trip. And you've been thinking about it. You've been uncertain, all right? It will fill up by the end of the day today. Uh, if you want to be a part of it, go to the information table on the way out, left-hand side of the hallway. We will get you information about that trip. Maybe you're like, hey, I don't know. I'm still not sure. Maybe after the weekend, there might be a spot left. You could write W-A-H on the back of your Connect card for Wild at Heart. W-A-H, circle it really big, drop it in the buckets when the buckets pass at the end of our time together. And we'll get in touch with you about that trip so that you could maybe make the decision if we do have some spots available. Here's a little video about the trip. Check it out. a little bit about the trip. Again, I hope maybe if you're a guy in here, you'll, you'll push past kind of the noise of not being a part of the trip and decide you want to take that step. I, I put this in your notes, just a final reminder. And this is really for young men, men who have kids. This is for women as well. And I wrote this down. Remember that no matter what age you are, you continue to let the heavenly father father you. Man, I, I, I'm, I have to say, like, I have counted on my dad for wisdom in my life and times to understand some, you know, things in my life. And in fact, my dad is still alive. I'm going to see him, you know, later today. And he does really well. He's 80 years old. And I could still um, visit with him about anything I need wisdom on in my life. But I think every man and every woman, everybody in this room understands as a natural part of life, there comes a time where you don't have an earthly father. And he's gone from this world. And this is why 
a transcending situation has been offered to humanity that's even greater than any earthly father, the best earthly father could ever be. Uh, there's something more that's out there. There's a relationship with a heavenly father that can actually walk by your side, grant you the wisdom to be the man you need to be, the husband, the father, whatever it is in your life, walk with you actually and dwell inside of you with the spirit of God to accomplish more than you could have ever thought you could accomplish to help you win the race in life regardless of whether you have an earthly father around. There is a good daddy there. And he is our heavenly father. Psalm 68 and verse 5. He is, this is what God is. He is a father. God is a father. The Bible says a father to the fatherless. He is a defender of widows as God and his holy dwelling. I do recognize that as I stand here today, there are some of you and you have lost your dad. You would do anything for him to be seated in the row with you right now on a Father's Day weekend at church. Uh, there are some of you here today and that's a reality for you and you miss them very much. There are some people in this room, you had a breakdown in the family at some point, and dad wasn't around. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe he worked all the time, a workaholic man who's never really around. Maybe you know that you have a biological father, but basically the way you see him is he was just a donor to your existence. Maybe for some of you, your father was an addict. He was a complete mess, and he missed some valuable moments of your life. Maybe he still is today. For some of you, you had a father who was abusive physically or sexually. For some of you, you have a father who's in prison. Can I just say what would be worse than having a father who had passed on? A father who is still alive and is not fathering you. That may be worse than anybody who's ever lost, for anybody who's ever lost their dad physically. Some of you in this room, you've been a believer for a long time and you've understood the power of what it means to take the hand of God and let him father you in your life. That you understood that this God that we have access to, he's not a remote God. He's not an unapproachable God. He's not some sort of cosmic force out there that we don't really know anything about him. That you understood by coming to know Jesus Christ that you have a relationship with him and you are walking daily with him and God is fathering you with wisdom, with strength, with the knowledge that you need to advance on in life, guiding you through some of the most difficult times of life. You understand that when Jesus said, when you pray, pray this, our father, he's a father. And you've learned this and maybe some of you here today, you need to take his hand. You, you're a man here today and you want to grow in fathering. You take his hand and say, okay, God, I, you're going to start guiding me and leading me in my life. Isaiah 42 and verse 6 says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and light for the Gentiles. God says, take my hand. I'll hold on. Isaiah 41 and 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God says, I'll do that for you. Now, can I tell you the moment that things radically changed for me in being an earthly father? It's when I first realized that I'm a son. I'm talking about a son of the Most High God. The moment I embraced my sonship, I became the father that I needed to be. The moment, ladies, you embrace the daughtership, that you are a daughter of the Most High God, then you understand who you are and you can take his hand and now let him father you, but also be the mother that you need to be as well. So maybe you're a guy here today. You're taking his hand and you're embracing God's sonship for you to be the father that you need to be. Here's what I want to do as we close out our time together. Would everybody in the room stand? 
Would you stand? Let's be shoulder to shoulder together here. You know, we're standing together. And here's what I want to do in a time together across this room. I want all of us in this room to just from where we're standing to be praying for dads in this room. And maybe perhaps you're seated next to a dad that you know. All right, don't, don't put your hand. I'm going to have you put your hand on a dad that you know or squeeze his hand if you want or whatever. Uh, don't do it if you don't know the person. All right, they might think you're weird. So, But if you know the person next to you as a father, all right, or you put your hand on their side or whatever and just pray for them. I think it would be good for us to pray that we have countercultural dads. We need it more than ever before. Let's pray for our dads. Maybe there are some dads here who need to embrace the fatherhood of the heavenly father. We're going to pray for them. Maybe some dads are being stirred. We don't know with what, but some sort of discipline for the way they need to move forward in life. Let's pray for these men first off. Father, we come to you now and if men across this room who, uh, God, I believe some have discovered this fathering and they're, they're, they're on this journey and, and the, it's being revealed to him, to, to this man, and a man in this room, the, uh, the goodness of being fathered by a heavenly father. And this has been a real and powerful journey for their life. But there may be, uh, there may be men who are needing to take steps today. God, uh, we pray, we join together. We pray for men in this room who need to advance on. They need to grow on. They need to discover more disciplines in their life. It's not easy. It's it's hard. It's tough. It's pain associated with discipline, but there is a fruit of the labor. There is a righteousness to be lived out for the man who discovers what it means to live for you, to be guided by you, God. And so we pray for men across this room. We pray for women in the room here who need to dig into being fathered. There are fatherless women in this room. But he is a father to the fatherless. And there are some women here who that needs to be more real part of their story. Uh, God, there are people amongst us right now. Maybe some of the men or women, young people here in this room, uh, that this needs to, to become a reality for them for the very first time, a relationship with the heavenly father, to know what so many others have discovered is so real, to be able to walk with God in, in their life and discover the wisdom and knowledge of a heavenly father. There's some people here right now who, who, who already know this, but there are others who it's foreign to them, but they're ready to take that step from where you're standing right now. You can do what I did. I was standing in a church. I just, God said, hey, it's time. And I recognized I wanted to take his hand. And God says, I will take and hold the hand of any human being who has been forgiven of their sin. And God said, I'm going to make a way for sin to be forgiven for all of humanity. I'm going to offer my son as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. For all who would believe, trust in the name of Jesus Christ, they could have their sin forgiven and have a relationship with God. God says, if you will accept the gift of my son uh, and be washed and cleansed from where you're at today, I will take hold of your hand and we will start moving forward together in life. He will father you to your dying day and then you'll cross over into eternity and you'll rejoice with him forever and ever. Would you receive him today right where you're standing? God, we come to you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.